Good morning and welcome to Spa Brunch Fun Days, where we invite you to tune in and tune out with a virtual spa break of music, food, and guests every week. Um, we're broadcasting live from sunny Pasadena today. I hope you all are having a delightful Sunday. It's a gorgeous spring day here. And, um, today we are cooking up some dishes that are going to totally surprise your guests. Um, we have with us a special, special, special guest, <laughs> Justin Marks. Um, you may remember last week we talked about edible flowers, and I met um, Justin as a result of that show. Um, his company, Mark's Foods, is one of my favorite resources. It has got amazingly they have rare foods like kangaroo, lots of different herbs and things that you really are not, not going to be able to find anywhere else. Um, and you can buy edible flowers there in bulk, um, which is really nice because, you know, you, you can share that with your friends then and, and you know, have a, a affordable way to indulge in these kind of exotic and unique foods. So let's welcome Justin. Um, he's on the, line, on the air now. Good morning, Justin. Hey, Candy. Good morning. Hey, how are you today? I'm doing great. Doing great. great. Ready to cook up some brunch. Oh, yeah, me too. I'm starving. <laughs> so um, tell, it, tell us a little bit about your company, about Mark's Foods. Sure, no problem. Uh, we're a fine food retailer online. For years and years, we only sold to restaurants across the country, but then we started getting a lot of calls from home cooks, so we decided to create a web store so that home cooks could shop like the pros. Yeah, and they, they, they sure can. I, I can. I'm so surprised by some of the ingredients, things I never even dreamed of cooking with or eating <laughs> on the site. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, you guys do a lot of fun things with food, too. You have a great blog that's your blog over on the site, and um, you have recipes and videos and yeah, for sure. Well, for the past few years, we've been uh, creating recipes to kind of demystify a lot of these ingredients. So, I'd say we've got you know we've got a great collection of uh, maybe 600 or so recipes kind of built around our products. And you know, as you know, there's a lot of really unique stuff. So we try to kind of demystify them and, and make them more accessible for home cooks because there's a lot of ingredients that that restaurant chefs get to work with and that we get to eat when we go out, but it's a little bit overwhelming sometimes to to try to recreate that at home. So we're uh, we're trying to make that easier. Yeah, and I I love that. I mean, it's all about trying new things. It's really fun. And I, what I love about um, Mark's Foods and everybody, it's um, www.marksfoods.com if you want to check out their site. Um, I love that it mainly focuses really on, on organic, fresh, um, ingredients, just just the way you know you like the we spa style kind of cooking is, and it, it also not just like the flavor, but it's just it makes cooking fun. Yeah, for sure. And we, uh, you know, probably you know making all these recipes and such is probably one of the most fun aspects of of running uh, the company because, and, and certainly I know that my staff loves it because uh, you know about uh, once a month for for a day or two we. We turn our kitchen in the office into a into a kind of a photo studio and bring in a chef and and cook amazing stuff all day long and uh, my staff loves it as do I. Oh, uh, you know I I want to come too. <laughs> so have you? Ever, well, you're welcome anytime, Candy. <laughs> so have you ever cooked anything in the um, kitchens that everyone was just like, "Ew, gross! I'm not going to eat that." <laughs> Yeah, we've had a few. We have had a few. Um, we definitely, you know, the chef that we work with is amazing, and he's he's he nails it about ninety eight or ninety nine percent of the time. But the uh-huh. thing is, is that sometimes that sometimes I challenge him with ingredients that he's never worked with, and uh, and there are some fails. And and then there's of course, you know, some people have aversions to particular kinds of food, like uh, uni, for example. Some people just have a difficult time kind of stomaching uni. So yeah, and that would be a good that? example. Like I don't even know what that well, is. is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's it's sea urchin roe, so it's uh, it's most commonly found on on Japanese sushi menus. But there's mm-hmm. also, you know, a lot of chefs, people who know food really well and you know real epicures, they they die over uni. Um, and I guess I get I must not be quite to the level where they're at because, uh, for example, one time we made this uh, scrambled egg dish with with uni and I think it was salmon roe and the recipe's on the blog for sure. Uh but anyway, it's kind of uh it didn't do it for me, but but the chef was kind of just 
just dying over the dish. And uh, but you know, cooking in the kitchen, experimentation. It's you know, there's definitely fails. And and I think at the end of the day, cooking is just kind of lining up a, a series of of techniques. And it and it takes a while to to practice those technique techniques and really get them dialed in. So definitely, experimentation and failing is part of the process. Yeah, and part of the fun. I mean, playing with it is definitely, I think, fun. You know, it keeps it from getting boring. And then it also is really great for your health because you get a really rich array of nutrients and things. So, um, but for right now, uh, let's let's go on and move on into talking about metals, which are the focus of our um, brunch today. Um, and so how did we come up with this, Justin? We were just talking about food and, and brunch. And you had just yeah, gone you know, metal foraging. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. we were having a conversation and, and uh, brainstorming things to talk about, and nettles came up. I mean, nettles are are such an uh, a perfect kind of spring food because that's that's when they're in season here in the in the Pacific Northwest. And it was just last weekend that that I went on a on a foraging trip for nettles, and and I had actually never foraged wild foods before, even though I know how to identify some berries and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I went on a guided trip, and the person who took me, Langdon Cook, who has a great book called Fat of the Land, and he's got all these great stories about foraging and such, he pointed all these great foods out, and then I realized, you know, I've been hiking in these mountains for eight years since since I moved out here, and there's food all around, and everywhere I looked was stinging nettles. And just thinking to myself, my God, there's such a bounty out here. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. I sort of, it's so funny. I have this like vision when you say foraging and you're talking about being out in the woods. I just have this vision of like cavemen for some crazy reason. <laughs> don't get me wrong, but it's just like I just well, yeah. you know, see people because I don't, I and mean, most people I don't, I think are pretty much frightened, you know, of eating anything that's not. You know, cleaned and you know what I mean. Eating anything from the wild. Yep. Oh, go wild ahead. Wild foods sorry. are pretty. Yeah, and that's okay. Wild foods are pretty amazing. You know, the thing about wild foods is that, you know, they they grow in the ideal place for them, right? And a lot of the mm-hmm. the mushrooms that we're used to eating, like porcini mushrooms, for example, is a is a wild forage product, and just some of the wild foods are just remarkably rich. And uh, mm-hmm. and flavorful, I love yeah. them. Um, and in a way, I mean, you know, you, in the they're picked from the pristine forests of the Pacific Northwest, and you can't really get much cleaner than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. And I'll tell me, you know, when I was telling some people about our show today, the first thing they said when I said stinging nettles, they were like, "Ouch!" Like, <laughs> you know. So how do you exactly. um, harvest them without getting stung? You know, I, I've had similar reaction, and and it's funny when I got back home after my foraging trip, I looked in my garden, and there was a bunch of stinging, stinging nettles uh, popping up, and I know that I would have needed to handle them with care in, when I was weeding, right? Because they were a weed in my garden. Yeah. Um, but you just have to use gloves. The stinging nettles are, uh, you know, they're, they have a sting to them. It's a defense mechanism. And you got to figure, you know, if they've developed a, a defense mechanism over time, they must be protecting something special. And uh, and there's a tremendous amount of nutrition and flavor, remarkable flavor. But really, all you have to do when you're handling them is use your gloves. And then there's two ways to dissolve the stinging agent in nettles. And one way is to blanch them, which is just to basically uh, boil them in water for about 60 to 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. And the other way to dissolve the stinging agent is to dry them. So if you're drying the leaves to make nettle tea or something. So those are the two basic mechanisms. But but basically, until you get the nettles into a pot or into the dryer, you just have to handle them with gloves. That's all. Oh, wow. That's that's simple. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, I, you know, because it's funny, until you and I spoke, like I'd always heard about stinging nettles as, as a health remedy, like nettle tea, um, like even like if there's the Gale Encyclopedia of Alternative Medicine and the Mayo Clinic, they both kind of recommend, you know, stinging nettles as a, you know, somewhat could be beneficial um, treatment for allergies. So if you have a lot of spring allergies, and especially it's appropriate this time of year, um, drinking the tea is supposed to, you know, help with your congestion. And um, it's kind of interesting. It reminds me of, um, you know, uh, 
kind of you know the antidote kind of thing because if you're allergic to the pollens you know you're probably it could be it could come from a stinging from stinging nettles can obviously be contributing to that so you drink that tea as the antidote <laughs> Um, so that's kind of an interesting, I thought that was very interesting when I read that. And, um, I, and there's all kinds of different, you know, kind of folkloric, you know, remedies for it, which of course there's not, I don't, I couldn't find scientific data, but definitely it's something that could definitely help, you know, with that. And um, they even said that stinging nettles, they're so rich in nutrients and vitamin A that they're really good. It's really good for eczema. And also with um, like kid, if you have a kidney infection, and now you're telling us, you know, telling me they 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 taste good too. So so what kind of flavor do they have when we cook with them? It's not, you know it's like the Szechuan buttons, and then it's it's really it's a little bit hard to articulate, but it's it's like a like a really rich green kind of spinachy, but but much more complex flavor. I mean it. <laughs> It's remarkable. They, they stand on their own. You know, one of the things we're going to make today is nettle pesto. And, you know, of course, everybody thinks of basil when they think of pesto. And, and you know how much flavor basil has. You would never really think of taking spinach and making it into a pesto because there just wouldn't be enough there. But you basically replace the basil with nettles, and what you have is just a remarkably flavorful pesto. It doesn't have that same kind of basil note, but it's got this spinachy, earthy, just deliciousness. Really great. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, so let's jump right in, too. Let's just get cooking. We're, um, we're going to do first nettle pesto scrambled eggs, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So, so yep. So uh, I guess I'll go through the, the basic pesto recipe first. Uh, okay. Pesto is really so simple. It's one first. of yeah, yeah. The pe- pesto is pesto is really simple, right? You got a traditional pesto, you know, which would be basil, garlic, pine nuts, salt, pepper, and Parmesan cheese. Now you can take that pesto and kind of spin it any any way that you want. You know, you could leave out the Parmesan if you have a dairy sensitivity. You could you could swap out walnuts for pine nuts if you didn't want to pay for pine nuts because sometimes pine nuts are like I don't know twenty twenty five bucks a pound. Um, mm-hmm. You could take away the garlic. You could you could add in other, other things. The way that I like to make a nettle pesto, uh, well, one one way would be simply to take the blanched nettles and and mm-hmm. put them in the pesto in the place of basil. But I like to also lately I've been adding uh, butter uh, to, uh, shallots that are toasted in butter. So I'll take I'll chop up some mm-hmm. shallots and and salt and saute some. Uh, saute them in some butter until they're nice and nice and brown, and, and then I'll add them in. But uh, I realize, let's take one step back on on the pesto for the nettles, and that's the blanching, which is basically get a pot of boiling water going. And I've done this part already, so I'm not going to do a lot. Um, get a pot of boiling water going and just put the nettles in there and boil them for 60 to 90 seconds, mm-hmm. and then you can strain off the water, and you can even, I mean, nettles are so flavorful that if you taste that water, you have vegetable stock right there. I mean, it's just amazing. 60 to 90 seconds in that water cooking, and you've got vegetable stock. So you could reserve the, the uh, blanching water if you want for stock, or you can just pour it off. And, and then what I do is I run some cold water over the nettles in, in order to uh, cool them down and to stop them from cooking. And at this point, once they're blanched, you can handle them with your bare hands. So mm-hmm. so I take the nettles out of the colander, and you just squeeze the water out of them. You just kind of grab them into a clump and just squeeze as much water as you can out of there. And and what you have is basically then a little ball of nettles, cooked nettles. And it looks kind of mm-hmm. like spinach, but it's a little bit stemmier. So I, you take the, the blanched nettles, and then and I always chop them up because the – they can be a little fibrousy if you if you don't chop them. So okay. just a rough cho- just a rough chop on them, and then basically mm-hmm. what you do. And now we're going to make our pesto. You take okay. your blanched and let, nettles. Let's stop it for one sec. But before you blanch them, you don't need to do anything with them before you blanch them, do you? Like cut any. You can rinse off. them. No, you can rinse them if you want. I, sometimes I rinse them if I have time. If I if I don't have time, I don't I don't even bother rinsing them. Okay. Um, you know, like they they come they come from the forest. They're literally. Handled handled with gloves and and the tips are cut off with scissors and thrown in a bag. So they come they come really clean. They're ready to go. But, okay, uh, great. You could rinse them, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So all right. So into a blender goes. Well, sorry. 
there's two ways that people make basil pesto traditionally. I guess three, right? The traditional way, I think, would have been with a mortar and pestle. But today, pe- you know, most people just use it with a food processor. Sometimes, and like today, I'll make, I'll make a pesto with, in, a, in my Vitamix, which is a, like a really uh, kind of top-of-the-line blender, kind of yeah. to blend anything. Um, anyway, so into the blender goes the, the blanched nettles, and then the other pesto ingredients. So in this case, what I'm using is, I'm gonna use, it, sorry, I started with about a half pound of fresh nettles, just for a recipe reference. Into the blender, I'm gonna add two cloves of chopped, bo- chop, chopped garlic, mm-hmm. a half cup of pine nuts, about a half teaspoon each of salt and pepper, a quarter cup of grated Parmesan cheese. I like to use Parmesan Reggiano, and then the butter toasted shallots, okay? And on top of that, then, uh, I'll pour olive oil. Pretty much, I don't know the exact measurement, but in my Vitamix, I just kind of fill up the olive oil until it reaches the top of the, of the nettles. You basically just have to have enough oil in there in order to process the pesto. Because if there's not mm-hmm. enough liquid, it, it won't process right in the Vitamix. Mm-hmm. All right, so then blender on and see if we can get this processing. Okay. Looks like I need a little more olive oil, so you're going to just splash a little more olive oil in there and turn it on again. Okay. And All right, and we got our pesto. Great. And now and you can actually can you can save this too for other recipes that you don't have to use the whole batch, right? Oh, for sure. Actually, so from a half from a half pound of nettles and these other ingredients, you could probably make like five dozen eggs worth of uh, scrambled eggs with pesto. Oh, wow. So most most definitely, there, there's a lot there. Mm-hmm. So you could take the pesto and you can, you know, do a traditional pasta with pesto recipe, you know, just take the pesto and toss it with some cooked pasta. We used it a couple weeks ago as a base for a pizza, and I don't remember the other toppings that went on it, but we basically used the nettle pesto in place of marinara sauce and then, you know, cheese and toppings and such. I think maybe we used sausage and some mozzarella. And oh, wow, stuff. yeah. Um, My mouth watering. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. Yeah, you could you could take the pesto and make a bruschetta with it, you mm-hmm. know, and just and just broil it. I mean, there's I mean, pesto is just so awesome. Yeah, it is. And how do you re- um re- like how do you, you know, keep it so it stays how long will it stay good for? I'd say, uh, you know, most most things that I cook, I just kind of try to use them within a week, and pesto right. would be no exception. So okay. I don't I don't know exactly how long it would take, but but anyhow. Okay. Uh, so shall we make our eggs? Yeah. So let's go with the eggs. Yeah. Okay. All right. So basically, this is kind of like a green eggs and ham, all grown up, like grown up to the max. Um, so I'm just going to take yep. a couple eggs and crack crack them in a bowl, and going to get out a whisk or a fork and it's just me here today so I'm just doing two eggs that's my rule of thumb you do kind of I do two eggs per person usually uh-huh. unless unless you're dealing with some really hungry people a couple eggs in a bowl and then I I'd say that I use and you could use you know there's no hard and fast rule you can use as much pesto if you like things really pesto-y then you could use probably I'd say a heaping tablespoon for two eggs that would be like a really nice green omelet Mm -hmm. so i'm just scrambling my eggs here getting my burner on a little bit of butter in the pan and then once the pesto is really incorporated into the eggs then uh throw them in the pan scramble them up pretty straightforward yeah yeah sounding good over there (laughs) Yeah, it's about to be tasting good over here too. I, you know, I should have sent you some uh, some nettles as well. I wish I had. You could have been eating this with me. Yeah, next time we'll definitely do it next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah, I've got enough flavors well, to try. I also have this great yuzu marmalade that we're going to use as, as an accompany, uh, accompaniment there soon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so, so uh, you know, I'm also going to throw a couple pieces of toast in the in the toaster, and and then we'll butter it up and add the yuzu marmalade and. Now, the yuzu, do you know yuzu? Have you ever had yuzu before? I haven't. No, I've never heard of it. So. Okay. Yuzu is a it's a Japanese citrus fruit and it's 
like so many things. I mean, the the Japanese they are amazing in in terms of just the the flavors that that they consume and that they've cultivated, and it's it's pretty remarkable. But it's a Japanese citrus, and it's just I don't even know how to describe it. Describe it. I think I'm gonna maybe let you try as you okay. uh, <laughs> as you taste it for the first time. All righty. So yeah, we'll let you scramble up the rest of those eggs there, and I will try this. And it is such a pretty jar. I have to say this first. It's beautiful. It's got the um, kenji uh, characters on the front, and it says using marmalade, and it's just it's almost like a little piece of artwork. This jar, but um, and I have not tried this yet. I'm just opening it up, and it. I always like to smell everything before I taste it. I don't know about y'all, but um, oh my god, it smells so good. It, it smells sort of like. It just looks like regular marmalade, but it smells like, I could smell like lime. Like, it's like a really amazing candle. I know a lot of our, our fans here at Spa Brunch Sundays are huge candle and fragrance fans at home. And, um, wow, it, it smells really, really good. And it has like a sort of a honey-like consistency. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Mmm. Okay. <laughs> I've been mm-ing on the air here. Um, it just, it Am I stomping you again? Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> you are. It tastes just like it smells. No, it's, it's like a like lime. I mean, lime, orange, and it almost like has a faint hint of like some kind of an um, a liqueur. Does that sound crazy, Oral. Justin? No. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. You know, you know, one of one of my downfalls is is. Uh, that you know, some people could taste something and just riff. You know, you could taste a wine and then riff on the blackberry and cherry and every other little note in there. It's definitely not one of my strong points, but I kind of liken the yuzu fruit in general to just a really complex citrus flavor. So it's like lemon, but there's just so much more to it. There's a floralness to it. There is a, a jasmine. A I totally smell jasmine. Yeah. Mhm. Oh, it's a really real fruitiness. Too. Yeah, it's so much better than just like orange marmalade. No offense to orange marmalade, but <laughs> but tasting this makes me really want to taste one of the fruits too. It, what does it taste like, just in its pure form? Have you had one? Well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's kind of it, it's just like that. You know, the, it's like the marmalade, except for there's there's no there's no sweet to it. It's just that complex citrus that yeah the way that the way that I've had the the fresh fruit was we had our holiday party at this uh, at, at Shiro's restaurant in Seattle, which is uh, definitely the best uh, sushi place in town. Mm-hmm. And what Shiro likes to do with, with the with the yuzu is he'll just squeeze a little bit on top of each piece of sushi, just a little bit, not even really a squeeze. It's kind of like he takes the citrus fruit and just and just the yuzu fruit and just kind of rubs it on top of the fish, mm. and it just gives it a little a little note of a little bit acidity. A little bit of fruitiness, just really amazing. Oh, I could see so many things cooked that way, just the rubbing the fruit. When it, that's a lovely way to just give it that hint without like oversaturating it. That yeah, would be exactly. Yeah. And you, and yuzu is one of those ingredients that I think is most definitely up and coming. Seeing a lot of uh, trend-setting chefs starting to incorporate yuzu on their on their menus, I would imagine. That this is one of those ingredients that's going to be everywhere in 10 years, but now people are just really starting to discover it. And the great yeah. thing about the about the yuzu marmalade is that it's just so easy to use and so accessible, and a, a great way to kind of experience the yuzu flavor for the first time because you can mm-hmm. literally just take it and spread it on toast. Yeah, which I did, and I could see like this in yogurt. Oh, it'd be really good in my, my Greek yogurt. Um, just in so many ways. Um, ice cream, or I mean, I, it might be really even good as uh, some, maybe on a meat, like what you're talking about, just like a very thin layer to give it, you know, just kind of play with it that way. But and I'm looking at the um, ingredients and the um, nutrition information on here, and it's it's one of these things because I'm going to tell you, I am, I love fruit spreads, but usually I just end up making my own because anything in the store is usually so high in sugar, you know, and that's all it is. So I'm a big prep fan of it, but this it's it just only only has 30 calories a serving. The sugar content is very low, only five grams, only two grams of carbs. So it's like really an you know uber healthy choice. Um, for yeah, that's the interesting bread. thing about 
that's an interesting thing about Yuzu is that there's there's so much complexity there. Like you know, if you took like a, a an equivalent fruit like a lemon or an orange, or if you imagine somewhere halfway between lemon and orange, um, you know, you would need to add so much sugar in order to make it palatable. But for some reason, Yuzu, you don't have to apparently. Yeah, it's really really good. So oh my gosh, okay, yeah, another sale there. <laughs> and um, and let's let um. I'm going to leave you for just a second, um, Justin, and we'll finish in scrambling up those eggs. Also, I want to just remind everyone right now we are talking with Justin Marks. He's the CEO of Marks Foods, and they um, retail. They, they It's really a cool, cool, cool company. They, they have a lot of rare and unique foods available that you won't find anywhere else. Not only that, they supply to restaurants and to us as, as foodies and food lovers. So it's, it's an amazing way to actually get that indulgent kind of restaurant feel and, and some of the ingredients that they have, you know, at home. Um, and his the website is marksfoods.com. So I want to encourage you to go there and check it out. They've got recipes, videos, um, so just everything you need to be like the ultimate cook. It'll definitely be a great party trick for you. <laughs> um, and we're cooking up a Easter brunch today um, using nettles, stinging nettles, actually. Um, which is kind of in season right now, and um, and we we've just finished cooking a nettle pesto scrambled egg. So anyway, so we've got um, Justin in the kitchen cooking up some nettle pesto eggs. I love it. The guy in the kitchen, <laughs> the dream there, Justin. <laughs> and um, my pleasure. Yeah. So let's see where he is with with, the, with our um, recipe. All right. Well, the the pesto eggs are pretty much ready to go. You know, okay. Basic scrambled egg recipe with 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 uh, pesto mixed in. Mhm. Boom. And ready to go. Chomp, great. Chomping on it right now. Great. Okay. I, you sound like you're eating. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting very hungry here. <laughs> um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Am I on the Am I on the radio? I just got yeah. lost in my pesto <laughs> eggs here. You're making all of our listeners starving. <laughs> it's a good job there. <laughs> um, and I've got this incredible using marmalade here, though. So I'm telling you, I am so psyched. I'm just, you know, we're always a huge fan of anything that like is healthy, but really it tastes good. The interesting thing, in my in my mind, you know, there's been, I think that the the tastiest stuff is the stuff that's also healthiest for you. I mean, I think that it's an old paradigm that healthy foods are bad for you. I think that that's, that's last century. Um, certainly, you know, once you kind of deprogram your palate from fast food and processed food and such, uh, you know, and, and kind of open it up to all the, the natural foods, it's the, it's the fresh, seasonal, kind of simple foods that, that taste the best and they're also the best for you. Right. I think and nettles is a great the- example of that. Yeah, and easy to prepare. I mean, like, how long did that take? Like 15 minutes. I mean, anybody has time to do that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have picky eaters at home, I know we have a lot of moms that listen to us. Um, You know, just just don't you know don't don't tell the tell the kids you know what's in there. (laughs) Let them taste it first. I I think sometimes kids might just like stick their nose up because they don't understand it. But or or if you train them when they're young, I think you know get them really excited about trying new things, make a game of it, sort of like like we are, you know, just taste it and have taste testings and you know make it fun. I think that's the way to always win them over. So. And another thing, too, with the nettle pestoed eggs is that you can read them Dr. Seuss green eggs and ham and then serve oh. up some nettle pestoed eggs. And, I mean, they couldn't be more excited about it. That is that is for sure. Oh, my gosh, I think we need to write Dr. Seuss' widow about that. <laughs> Maybe she'll yeah. put the recipe in, like, the next, cook, the next you know, edition of green eggs and ham. <laughs> you are brilliant. Can Maybe. I hire you as a marketer, Candy? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, but yeah. So so while Justin is eating there, I wanted to actually share with you all because I, I did a, I was doing a bit of research on on nettles before the show, and um, I found some really interesting things. Not only like the health benefits of it, but um, I found a, a, an article that said that Caesar, Caesar Caesar's troops brought nettle from England, like just really because he was so entranced by it. Thought that was kind of interesting, and um, and also apparently nettle is also really good for um, fabric. 
it can it, it, because of the um, it's some kind of property of like the fibers in the plant. It can be used to make especially like really durable clothing. And I read that it was made. Um, it was the, the uniforms in the German army during the First World War, World War were made of nettle. Isn't that bizarre? That's really wild. And you know what? I believe it because. The, like I said, you have to you have to chop the nettles before you use them because otherwise they'll be a little bit stringy if you if you leave them whole. Mm-hmm. And that's that's even with having just basically when they harvest the nettles, they just take the top leaves and bud, and and that's even when the plant is young. So I would imagine by summertime when the nettle plant is much bigger and kind of has become much hardier that the fibers would probably be really strong. So that makes sense. So, oh, great. Well, um, gosh, Justin, I can't believe it. It's like time to go. <laughs> oh, so, this was so fun. Oh, it was. And thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your spending an hour of your Sunday with us. And, um, Problem. And- I, have, I have a few people waiting for me, and uh, we're actually going, uh, going hiking. So maybe even harvest some nettles while we're out there this afternoon. All right. Well, let us know. Have a fabulous time. And um, we're looking right. forward to definitely having you on again. And I'm going to um, be posting um, the links to Justin's website and um, to some to all the recipes that we talked about today. Um, and also want to encourage you just to go over there and just look around, play. It's, it's a really, really fun place. So um, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And um, happy Easter, everyone. And so goodbye to Justin. And we'll talk with you again soon. Have a Have great, a great day. You too. And all of our listeners, have a great day. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.